Now, among the Jews in the days of our Lord, the rich among the covenant people were generally viewed as especially favored and blessed by God. They looked at it as God's providential blessing. Those who were poor and lived with some disease or handicap were generally regarded as guilty of some great sin and were considered to be living under God's special providential displeasure. Remember the blind man? Hey, Jesus, tell us. Who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents that he was born blind? That was the common attitude. If you, if you were in misery, if you were poor, if you were in a desperate condition, it had to be your fault. You must have done some great sin. That was a common view among the Jews, and we see that God tries to correct that view to a degree in the book of Job, but it didn't stick. The Jews still felt that way. <clears throat> this part of the parable ought to warn us regarding such thinking. The poor man was a believer. He was godly, and he went to heaven. We do not see him complaining about his condition, or blaming God in any way for his suffering. He quietly and calmly hoped in God with a steady faith. He did not blame God in any way for his suffering. He had a steady faith despite his suffering. He looked to God. He trusted in God. No bickering, no complaining. The rich man, however, who had every blessing in this world that people seek after, he was looked up to, was an unbelieving, spiritually blind, heartless, selfish, worldly, dead in trespasses and sins. And yet I'm sure people looked up to him. Look at that man. Look at that outfit. Look at those clothes. Oh, they're having pheasant again. Look at this. Look at the food. Look at that house. Boy, God's really blessing him. He must be a wonderful, a wonderful uh, believer. He must be highly favored of God. even though they emulated him as blessed by God. In reality, he was living under the curse of Jehovah's law and had the wrath of a thrice holy God upon him the whole time that people were looking up to him. <clears throat> we must reject the common American notion that the richer someone is, the more popular and highly regarded they ought to be. And of course, this view is infected evangelicalism to a degree with the health and wealth gospel. Your Joel Olsteins, your spiritual Oprah Winfrey's. You know, the purpose of Christianity is for you to be healthier, better looking, have a better car and a bigger house. You've got to get away from that view of Christianity. Okay, we reject left-wing evangelicals such as sojourners or a bunch of socialist pro-democrat, pro-socialist, pro, uh, uh, satanic uh, liars, yet we have to fight against the other view, which sees Christ as the door to prosperity, the prosperity, health, and wealth gospel. Yeah, if you follow God's law, it's a general principle, generally speaking, that you will be blessed. And cultures that follow God's law, that are Christian and follow God's law, generally are blessed. The Puritan work ethic, look what it did for America. However, it's not a universal principle. It doesn't apply in all cases. Our focus must be on one's beliefs, worldview, and godliness. Once again, while it is generally true that God will economically prosper those who believe in His Son and obey His laws, it is not always a reality. There are poor Christians who are very godly. There are many poor oppressed Christians in this world. Moreover, did not Paul write this? <clears throat> this is from 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not. 
to bring to nothing the things that are, in order that no flesh should glory in his presence. And this is certainly one reason why God said through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That's the biblical perspective. That's the biblical worldview. Great wealth is not necessarily a mark of God's favor and, and uh, poverty is not proof of God's displeasure. It can be, but it's not. You have to look at somebody's belief system and their ethic, how they live their lives, what do they believe in. Those whom God justifies and glorifies are seldom the rich of this world. If we would measure men as God measures them, we must value them according to their grace. Donald Trump and Oprah Winfrey and Hollywood and these rich people today, these unbelieving rich people, they're disgusting in God's sight. And the wrath of God abides, them, abides on them. We should not look up to these people. Well, let's look at the contrast in the world to come. We looked at their condition on earth. Let's look at the contrast to come. And we're not going to complete this today, but we'll get a good start. The next scene begins with the death of both men. Verse 22. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. This verse serves as a, a transition point which connects the two scenes. Scene one and scene two. The beggar due to his physical condition dies first. There's no mention of a burial. Because it is probably either, he was probably either quickly thrown into a mass grave, or even worse, he may have been tossed into a hidden ditch or ravine off the beaten path, as with Calvin thinks. They just, somebody dragged him, you know, people, you know, his body started to stink, they dragged him and threw him into a ditch somewhere. He had no one to care for him in life, and no group to send off his body with a decent burial. Although his physical body received no dignity or honor from men, <clears throat> it was precious in the sight of God. And thus remember, on the morning of the resurrection, the day that Jesus Christ returns, his dust will be raised by Christ, glorious and immortal. Just remember that. The rich man died also and was buried. He, no doubt, was praised, placed in a very expensive, large, carved sepulcher, carved out of solid rock and beautiful, with a beautifully fine carved monument on his tomb. There were probably a very, very large group of people attending his funeral and weeping and crying and moaning for him, this rich man. Jesus wants his audience to focus his attention on the fact that all men die. All men die. The richest, most powerful man in the world cannot prevent his own death. Rich and poor alike all go into the next world with nothing from this life. There is a time to be born and a time to die. Ecclesiastes 3.2 Psalm 82, 7, all shall die like men. Now, the typical American day does not think about death, especially young people. People deliberately ignore it as if it will never come. Most act as if life goes on forever, and there is no need to prepare for the world to come. And this was certainly the attitude of the rich man who lived not for God or his kingdom, but for self. Remember, there's no overt sins here. The point is, is the man was selfish. He was totally focused on himself. He lived to have fun and get everything out of life he could, but he failed to consider the state after death, the state that goes on forever. 
When you die, that's it. The rich, man fly, the rich man's fine clothes, his beautiful estate, and luxurious feasting all came to an end. And the beggar's intense suffering came to an end as well. You see, death marks the great turning point for both the poor suffering saint and the unbelieving rich man. Now you think, you young person who says, well, beg Christ, I don't need Christianity, I don't need Jesus Christ, I'm having a good time, I'm partying, I'm having fun. You go look in the mirror, and that face of yours, your beautiful clothes, that face of yours, you're going to die, you're going to be placed in the ground, and that flesh will turn gray and then green and then rot, and the maggots will eat your flesh, and your eye sockets will be consumed by maggots and bacteria, and your soul will go to hell. Think about the state, the state to come. Now Christ notes that the believing beggar's death, God expresses his love and care for him by sending the holy angels to transport his soul to paradise. Yeah, people didn't care about him, but sure, God certainly cared about him. God loved him. How much did the honor done to his soul by this conveying of it to its rest exceed the honor done to the rich man by the carrying of his body with so much magnificence to its sepulcher? His worldly friends weeped and cried for him, and they carried his body off with women weeping and crying. But Lazarus had his soul carried by the angels of God, plural, unto heaven. Both the death of Lazarus and the rich man, in it we see the biblical doctrine that at death, the souls or spirits of men are separated from their physical bodies. The believer goes to be with God, while the soul of the unbeliever goes to hell. The souls of men do not perish at death, and they are not reincarnated to another body. And of course, there's no such thing as soul sleep either. The moment you die, the moment that bullet penetrated Osama bin Laden's eyeball and his brain exploded, he found himself in hell. The moment you die, you either go to be with Jesus Christ, or you go into the pit of darkness into hell. It's a sobering thought. This life is all that we have. <clears throat> and if we do not place our faith in Christ and serve Him, we don't receive any second chances. There's no reincarnation. There's no purgatory. The Roman Catholic heresy where you place them between heaven and hell where you get to burn off your venial sins and then get to heaven eventually. No. It's over. You're either a Christian and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you go to heaven or you're not a Christian. It's that simple. And you better wake up to that reality and believe in Christ and serve Him and make Him the Lord of your life and Bow the knee to him now while you're still alive. Back in the 1970s, I, a friend of mine, when I was in seminary, a friend of mine <clears throat> asked me to witness to his father, who was an atheist. So I went over to his apartment, and I sat there on the couch, his father sitting over in a chair, and my buddy's there. And I witnessed fervently to this man who the whole time mocked. He mocked me, he mocked God, he mocked the Bible, he mocked Jesus Christ, and he laughed when I warned him of hell. And the very next day, he had a massive heart attack and died and went straight to hell. I've had friends who I witnessed to, people that were, were friends of mine before I was a Christian, I would witness to them, and then a week later, they're dead in a car accident. One young gentleman, he got a court, well, this is, he was rich. His, his dad bought him a Corvette for his for uh, graduation. He went out, he got drunk, and he went 120 miles an hour and hit a tree. The car disintegrated, he was dead. Went straight to hell. You've got to choose Christ. You've got to believe in him. You've got to place all your trust in him and repent 
now.